welcome to episode 17 of Reading Track, a Star Trek book club podcast and proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions Podcast Network. I am one of your hosts, Marty Ali, and I am joined by my brand new co-host, Christian Jewell. Christian, how are you doing today? I am exhausted. How are you, Marty? I'm exhausted as well. Um, At least we're exhausted it's together. It's been a little while since we've had a Reading Trek novel discussion because... Um, life happens and stuff. So here we are, episode seventeen. Um, what are we? What are we going to be talking about today? What novel are we discussing tonight? We are discussing the first of the Star Trek Titan novels, entitled "Taking Wing" by Michael A. Martin <laughs> and Andy Mangles. That's the book. I know it's a book. The book. Um, but before we dive into this week's novel, let's let everyone know how they can get a hold of us. You can follow Reading Trek on Twitter at Reading Trek. You can like our Facebook page. Um, you can also find us online at readingtrek.thetricordertransmissions.com where you can leave us a voice message by tapping the little bar on the side. Um, and you can also find us on Patreon if you'd like to support the show or the network by visiting patreon.com slash the tricorder transmissions. Um, you get access to all kinds of exclusive stuff from Tricorder Transmissions. Um, stuff that you probably do not want to miss out on. Um, but with that said, let's go ahead and get right into this week's novel. Where and when does Titan take place? The question isn't where we are. It's when we are. Titan takes place very shortly after... Star Trek Nemesis, the star date, or I get, there's no star date here. It's the year 2379, and it's also very shortly after the novel Death in Winter. It's a next generation novel. All right, Black Alert, we're going to get right into the summary for Titan Taking Wing. Take it away, Christian. Black Alert. Black Alert. So we, we begin on Romulus, where a mysterious Romulan called Rukoth pays a visit to Ambassador Spock, who is still working towards unification on the, of the Vulcans and the Romulans. He gives Spock a message from the Federation Council. They will fully endorse his cause of reunification if he comes back to Earth and makes a formal report. Spock refuses, claims his work is there, and with the political upheaval, he cannot leave. Even after a mind meld, he still decides to stay. On his way out, this is when Shinzon has murdered the Senate. This mysterious Romulan is hit on the head. We cut to a short time later. The Luna-class starship Titan is getting ready to make her maiden voyage. We meet several characters on the most diverse crew in Starfleet history. Starfleet Admirals Leonard James Akar and William Ross pay a visit to the Titan at the same time, making everyone question why they are there. Riker needs an executive officer. He wanted war for Geordi, but neither of them can or will take the position. His third choice is Christine Vale, the current security officer of the Enterprise. She's weary to take the position because she doesn't agree with Riker making his wife, Deanna Troy, a bridge officer. He talks her into taking the position for a third pip. Meanwhile, the creator of the Luna class, Dr. Ra Havri, wants to join the ship on her maiden voyage for an unknown reason. The Titan is forced to set aside its exploratory mission to undertake a diplomatic mission to Romulus, where tensions between the Romulans and the Remans have flared up. There are factions within the Romulan Empire who want to gain control in the void left by Shinjan's death. A small fleet of Klingon warships joins the Titan, since the Klingon Empire has made the Remans a protectorate of their empire. During a secret meeting with the top factions, the Federation party finds that the Romulans want to keep the Remans out of power, as they always have been. The Titan undergoes a recovery mission for Commander Tuvok, who was the undercover operative on Romulus. He's being helped by the Remans, who also have befriended 
Spock. The breakout is violent and many people are injured. The Remans are angry that the Vulcans are taken. Riker negotiates a temporary peace between the Romulan factions, but a fleet of antiquated Romulan ships crewed by Remans take positions over the cities of Romulus, threatening violence if the Romulans do not agree to concede an uninhibited, an uninhabited, I knew I was going to get that wrong, <laughs> southern continent for their use. Romulan commander Dinatra, who helped the crew of the Enterprise in their battle against Shinzon, has amassed a large fleet of warbirds and is using the spatial rift created by the destruction of Shinzon's Thaleran weapon to hide them. Unfortunately, most of these ships fall into the anomaly, and only Saran's flagship escapes to tell Dinatra what has happened. The stalemate between the Romulans and the Remans breaks into a space battle, and the Titan is hit by, a large, by large space debris. There are casualties, including the chief engineer and the chief of security. He's only injured, though. Dr. Rahavri takes over into engineering, and Tuvok takes over for security. Rahavri admits to being on board because of a flaw that ended in the destruction of one of the sister ships of the Luna class. Riker is able to broker a semi-peace where the Klingons are set to remain behind with the Remans as their protectorate. Spock will go back to the Federation Council and discuss Romulan and Reman matters. Dinatra decides to enter the anomaly to search for her lost fleet, and she asks Riker to help her. He accompanies her to the edge of the event horizon, and both ships are pulled inside. They find themselves outside the galaxy in the small Magellanic cloud. There we go. Tuvok and Akar have traveled here previously aboard the USX Excelsior while under the command of Captain Huraku Sulu. This, they say, is the home of the Neyal, a race of genetically enhanced humans a people they had some contact with prior. And thus begins the adventures of the USS Titan. Hooray! <laughs> you did it. Oh, I did it. Okay. What are your, like, first overall thoughts about the novel? My first thoughts about the novel really are seeing how we have two authors here. It really feels like, as you're reading it, that you're almost reading two different books that are melded together. They have their own voices, both of these authors. One of the authors is, um, it was Andy Mangles. He is an openly gay author who, in my history, has been, I think, the only openly gay Star Trek writer before. So I think if you look back, through the story, if you look back through the book and the characters, and we have two LGBT characters in the crew. And so you can definitely see his influence on the story. The other author, Michael, Michael A. Martin, he, I, and this is my guess, but I think that he was probably more the kind of serious Star Trek writer of the book. Yeah, I definitely got that there were two, two wow words. Oh my gosh, <laughs> two chain two. Blah, blah. There were two different uh, voices in this novel, um, but overall, I mean, it it's basically a setup for what's going to be like now seven novels in the series. There might be nine, but you also you also have to think of because they've been included right. in the series Destiny. They were included within the Fall. They were included within the um, Typhoon Pack. So you know, none of those that I've read. No. <laughs> um, if I haven't covered it on Reading Trek, I probably haven't read it. So. <laughs> Um, but I was, um, going back to the gay characters, I was really excited that there were a couple of gay characters. Um, and one of the cute little moments um, when, oh, what is his name? I can't, oh, by the way, I can't pronounce any of these characters' names. 
Titan has the most diverse crew of any Federation starship, and everyone is an alien, and everyone has an impossible to pronounce name. Um, part of my, I guess, frustration with the novel is that I could not keep the characters' names and their race together in my head. Mm -hmm. So it was very disorienting trying to read this novel. But I, I found <clears throat> the characters whose races that we knew, whose species, I should say, that we knew, I found that they were easier to keep track of than the one-off characters with species that we've never heard of before. Yeah. It was, um, oh, how cool was it that the Dr. Ree is basically like a dinosaur? A dinosaur in space? Dinosaurs in space. <laughs> and we thought they were all dead. So back to the LGBTQ character. Is he single? He felt his cheeks beginning to flush again. And I wrote, oh my gosh, yay, a gay character. So we had Raynal or Ranal? Raynal Carew, who was a, a burly bear trill. Mm -hmm. He was the head of security. Mm -hmm. He was introduced in a prior Star Trek novel that was written by the same authors. It was in the Section 31 series mm -hmm. called Rogue. That story kind of gave a back history of him and his partner at the time, who was Hawk. Hawk was on First Contact. He was the cutie patootie con officer who was assimilated on the walk outside yes. the Enterprise. Yes. I know him well. <laughs> that actor is on a bunch of other like science fiction shows that I've also watched, so I see him all over the place. So that's where we first met him, and he is still brokenhearted years. I mean, this is probably at least five to seven years, I would say, after, after first, first contact. contact. Yeah. And he's still very brokenhearted. Kenneth Norellis was the um, other gay character, the one who liked him. And... We, we, you mentioned the most diverse crew, and I had a real problem with him at one point because he he was very xenophobic against uh -huh. Dr. Ree. And... A lot of the characters were xenophobic against Dr. Yes. Ree just because his appearance is outwardly um, terrifying. Did... One of the sweetest characters in the entire like, yes. novel. So, Well, it really goes to juxt juxtapose against... His look is don't judge. It's the right. whole adage of don't judge a book by its cover because... Appropriate, I mean. <laughs> his personality was a lot better than his looks. But one of my favorite moments with these characters was when he made these comments again about Dr. Ree and Nurse Agawa puts him in his place. Yeah. She really schooled him. I, I love that this novel included some characters from some like more minor characters from Trek, like uh, Canon Trek. Yes. Like Nurse Ogawa and um, Tuvok is in this as mm -hmm. well. And of course, Riker and Troy. We get Spock. It's, we get he's, Sp he's not going to be a major character in the series, but he's in there. He's a presence. We also get Melora Pazlar, who was yeah, in from Deep Space Nine. Nine. She was also in a two book series called Gem World from Next Generation. Yeah, a very far fetched one was Admiral Akar. Admiral Akar was born in one of the original series episodes. To, oh, Friday's Child, and Doctor McCoy was the doctor who gave birth to him. And so he's named after James T. Kirk and Leonard McCoy. And so Capellans, who the, his race, he's the super tall man now, but he becomes a big presence in all of the post nemesis books. So you'll be looking out for him. He's kind of taken the place of Admiral Necheyev She's still a big character in the books too, but he's kind of has he kind of has that personality that you kind of love to hate him. You know that when he's 
coming aboard someone's starship that he's going to shake some stuff. Yeah. Up. Any other characters you want to highlight before we move on to the actual uh, story of the novel? Well, there's so many characters. And as as this series moves along, so I guess, I guess I'll spoil things too. I read the majority of the Titan novels. I think there's maybe two more I have not read, but... Well, you're a big Star Trek book reader. You've read a large majority of them, which I, is why I picked you for I'd love, co-host. I'd love so. to count. I'm, I'm sure that I'm over... I'm probably near 300 by now. Yeah. Um, Versus me, who is reading through them as I do this podcast. <laughs> Part of the reason I started the podcast. Well, we'll go well together, like peanut butter and jelly. Yeah, you can... Fill me in on everything I miss it. Uh, don't pick up. So big characters, they, you know, they, I, I'm not going to talk about all of them because there's so many they brought up in this book. But, I mean, we've already talked about Dr. Rahavri, who was the, one of the designers of the Titan. He's an Afrosian who was the president on Star Trek VI. So he's got that uh, kind of white goatee with the long beard and the white hair. That's the species that he is. And um, he wasn't he wasn't too snarky in this novel. I do I do I don't want to spoil too much, but I think he gets a little snarky in the next few novels. I like snarky. <laughs> Snarky's my jam. It's almost a shame that we didn't get to know. Uh, Chief Engineer Led- Ledra better because you you were kind of enjoying the few interactions that she had and her death was just kind of out of the blue. It's, I remember it happening from the first time I read this book and reading it again it was a lot sadder this time. It really touched me a lot more but she was a, a Tiburon and she has seashell ears and blue hair See, I see. This is the thing. It's like they're the descriptions for some of these species are just so. I don't want to say bonkers because that <laughs> th- would that make me xenophobic if I said that. Does like that it's go, just so. Does that go against the whole? I know, the like most I, diverse crew thing. And on a related note, I actually have something highlighted here that I just noticed in my notes. Um, it's a quote. It says, I have come less in a military capacity than in what Starfleet Command and the Federation Council would no doubt describe as humanitarian. His brief pause made the irony of his last word conspicuous. Everyone present was well aware that humans comprise a distinct minority aboard Titan. And my my question is, shouldn't we have come up with a better word for humanitarian by the time the 24th, almost 25th century is around since we have met all these alien species. The Federation of Planets is basically just a large um, uh, the, uh, melting pot. Melting pot of alien species from different worlds. Um, so I think to use the word humanitarian in that time is almost taboo because now you're. What, trying to draw everything back to humans, mm-hmm. which is weird. Shouldn't the Federation be coining new words as like replacements for these kind of human-centric things, like humanitarian? It does seem like a very late series enterprise. Yeah, it does. So talking about, before we move on with characters... While we're while we're picking this apart a little bit, I was a little bothered by the emphasis on the most diverse crew. In the same way that you're bothered by the word humanitarian, because by the 24th century, I don't want it to be a big deal that it's super diverse. I want it to right. be just exactly. a thing. It's just something a little off about it that like I don't why why why? I mean if if by the 24th century, we're not there yet, then, gosh, I don't know if I want to be in that universe. But... Well, we won't be. We'll be dead, but that's okay. Well, I don't know about you, but I plan to live forever. Mm. 
<laughs> get it. Enough Riker there. <laughs> but the most diverse crew became a catchphrase, I felt, for the first half of this book. I, okay, I had a lot of trouble getting through the first half of the book, and I actually stopped reading halfway through because I uh, could not get past... It was just, I mean, it was so much, so much exposition in the first half of the book. And I was like, is this going to go anywhere? And then it did. There was a lot. But basically, it's it's one novel to set up the rest of the novels. Yes. So There was a lot. But to kind of counter that argument, I I did like that we got to see the setup of a starship before it took off on its maiden voyage. Mm-hmm. We kind of got a glimpse in Voyager a little bit. Voyager, yeah. A little bit at the beginning of Next Generation. But I mean, this was when it was still in dry dock and they were still bringing in their... They were still building... Yeah. They were still building rooms yeah. and like uh, adjusting quarters for um, different species needs and all that stuff. So... All the modifications and accommodations that are part of my daily life at work. Yeah. But I like that we got to finally see the kind of takeoff of a ship. That was kind of, that was fun to me. So other characters, we talked about Dr. Reesum, <laughs> his, his species name, Paqua Thun. Oh, I have no idea. Um, so he's said to be built like a running dinosaur with humanoid arms, an iguana-like head, and finger-length teeth. Human arms, dinosaur head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sounds like um, somebody went to the Halloween store and put on a dinosaur mask and dinosaur pants. And like, <laughs> that's what you got. That's Dr. Dr. Ree. Well, and so, it's, also, like, it's also that <laughs> I don't get it. Seashell ears. Seashells for ears. But it's like... Do you hear the ocean all the time? <laughs> if you have seashells for ears? How does that work? Melora Pazlar. We mentioned her before. So she's an Elasian. She comes from a gravity-free world. She's the one who is... I love this character. I did too. I, I really wish that they brought her back on D Space Nine. Yeah. For especially, another go around, but they didn't. Especially They're because I, I really thought that she and Dr. Bashir hit it off. Um, yeah. I mean, had I think had Deep Space Nine been a little more Discovery-like, I'm sure we would have seen her again. But The quote that I had from her was, If I take this job, the Stellar Cartography Lab is going to be micro-G most of the time, she had said firmly. Not to put too a fine a point on it, sir, but I've adapted to everyone else's need for gravity for a long time now. I think it's time that my colleagues begin to adapt to some of my more free-floating needs. I like that uh, she's still standing up for herself. She was very outspoken on Deep Space Nine, and I like that they continue this in her character. There was a, a scene where she's coming into her... Was it her quarters or her... Or was it stellar cartography? I don't remember. But it's near the beginning of the of the book, and there's some crew members who are messing around in there, and it really ticks her off. And I I just I, I enjoy that she stands up for herself like she does. Do you have anything else for characters? Well, the only other character besides the two LGBTQ characters we talked about. But there's two more that we should mention. Um, I liked Braylick, the Fringy. She brought some mm-hmm. some much needed comic relief. Comic yeah. relief. Um, I can hear you. <laughs> she reminded me, even though she wasn't it wasn't a female, she reminded me of the doctor that Beverly works with in that episode where She's doing this, the doctor was doing the science experiment and it fails where they flew the shuttlecraft into the sun. Oh, right. The one that, and then Beverly just got all. Beverly quit her job. Yeah. (laughs) But she reminded me of that character, even though it wasn't a female. For some reason in my head, I kept thinking it was female. So I went back and checked and it wasn't. But 
She's the first. The character on the show was yeah. not female, but the character yeah. in the book is female. And she's also the first female that we've seen in Star, female Ferengi that we've seen in Starfleet. What's interesting too. Oh my gosh, was... you brought up melting pot earlier, and I have a quote <laughs> highlighted with USS melting pot in it. <laughs> Sorry, tangent. I didn't mean to interrupt. Here aboard the USS Melting Pot, we built a sort of cultural atom smasher, a laboratory designed to create clashes of customs and manners, if you really think about it. I'm not very organized today, so it's all over the place, but it's Thursday. So we also have Ogawa still. Ogawa's awesome. She always has been. She always will be. So she, now we saw at the end of Next Generation that she was pregnant and because in the series finale, she lost the baby in one of the temporal mm-hmm. loops. in one of the loops. And but of course, it was that was undone once that was all packaged away. And her, she has a son named Noah, who's who is like a younger version of Wesley, basically it's less like, annoying. Oh, I love Wesley. Oh, um, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> no offense to any Wesley fans. But she loses. She's lost her husband in the Dominion War. So she and it's tragic Karu, that war, bad war. Yeah. She and Carew kind of have a kindred nest to them, both having lost the ones the ones that they've loved. And the last character that we should touch on is Christine Vale. Christine Vale. As I as I read about her, I picture Tasha Yar. I picture kind of a tomboy looking character. They didn't really discuss. I think she had dark hair in this novel, but her hair color becomes a, a big point of discussion in, in future novels. Um, she was in the Time Two series, so right before right before Nemesis, they put out nine novels, I believe. They're like a time to so a time to heal a time to love a time to kill and they're kind of spanning between insurrection and nemesis to let us know kind of what leads up to that so that's where her character comes from um she was she always just wanted to be a cop and so she was the security chief on the enterprise and Riker wanted her, even though she was his third choice. <laughs> he had to ask her three times to be his executive yeah. officer. But her- she's a great character. Yeah. I love her. Um, there's a moment when they're on the Klingon the Klingon ship having dinner, and she she says, if whoever has his hand on my ass doesn't remove it immediately, he will become my greatest triumph in battle. <laughs> So that was one of the quotes that I tagged for one of my favorites. <laughs> and then a moment later, uh, a moment passed, and the three of them were materializing on the Titan's Bridge in an alcove near the door that led to the head. Space toilets. Vale immediately wished she could excuse herself to <laughs> divest her stomach of its objectionable contents, but duty was duty. <laughs> What I like about that moment, too, was that it was a female Klingon who was giving her the feel. I loved (laughs) all the representation in this book. I I feel refreshed, renewed, I'm ready to go. (laughs) Okay, so we talked about our characters quite a bit, quite a bit. Yes, we did. We didn't talk about Riker and Troy, really. Well, I mean... We, we know them so well. I mean, we, nothing has really changed. They're still Riker and Troy. They're still Riker and Troy. They, you know, he, he's made her his senior dipl- diplomatic officer. And Riker's kind of living in Picard's shadow at this point. He's, he's made decisions based on how Picard's command style was. Yeah. Like merging the dining room, mess hall, bar, mm-hmm. recreation area into one area, which similar to uh, 10 forward on the D. Um, he's decided he wants to be distant from his crew, like Picard kind of was. Um, but then Troy has to kind of like nudge him, you know? I love that quote. Uh-huh. 
don't wait seven years to join the poker game, Will. That was one of my yeah. other favorite yeah. quotes. <laughs> Mine too. But anyways, I think we can move into some more of the like plotish stuff. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciated that they acknowledged some of the things that happened in Nemesis that weren't so good. They mentioned it and moved on. Well, luckily B4 is not a bridge character. <laughs> uh, luckily he's not a character in the book at all. But <laughs> so, so can I just go off on a tangent for a moment? Yeah. So this past weekend, I was watching Star Trek movies. I watched Star Trek Beyond, which is one of my favorite Star Trek movies. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, you know... Definitely top three of the Kelvin films, yes. <laughs> Maybe we'll get a four. <laughs> if the Chris's will just stop arguing. I decided, I decided to watch Nemesis after that, which was such a letdown. I watched, After Beyond? After Beyond. Oh, honey. Why would you do that? Right? But I got maybe a quarter of the way through and i just i had to turn it off and it's not a movie that i, I hate i am a nemesis apologist i have to be in the mood for an action movie to watch nemesis because that's what it is it's yeah. an action movie but you know there's it's the whole thing where um world. the enterprise's last mission to Rodney gets might have been traumatic enough Russians for on? that ship and her crew bringing about the deaths of lieutenant commander data and scores of others not to mention the psychic rape that Shinzon himself had inflicted on Deanna, though Riker had no doubt that his wife and diplomatic officer would do her duty without hesitation. He could also guess how hard it would be for her to return so soon to the very place where Shinzon had violated her. And they, they go into it a lot further when they go to that meeting. I mean, they really, because it's yeah. the point of view at that secret meeting on Romulus, which I don't know if I mentioned that in my overview. There's a secret meeting on Romulus, by the way. And the secret meeting is because Praetor Talora, who is not very popular, by the way, she is one of many who wants leadership of the Romulan people. Mm -hmm. And she's only here because she was the one senator who agreed to work with Shenzhen. And so she kind of has a lot of people who hate her. And she's the one who left the Thaleron, small Thaleron weapon inside the Romulan Senate that killed everyone. So they go to this meeting and she wants the Remans out of the meeting. She wants this without them. And that's a real point of contention for the Federation. But they go to this meeting and the point of view is seen through Deanna Troy. And you really get that first person just description of what she's going through, beaming down back there again and just the anguish that she's going through, but she makes it through that meeting. And she's a professional. She is. And the squabbling between the Romulans at this meeting, she, she finally has had enough and she, she kind of puts her foot down and, and says, excuse me, I was in the tall Shiar before, which is another throwback to uh, next generation when she was surgically altered to be a tall Shiar agent. And it was that that was my favorite scene of the entire book was just her really commanding the moment because early on in next generation, Deanna Troy was not a strong character. No, and I mean, she famously talks about it at conventions that she was going to be fired after the first season. Yes. Had, um, had Denise Crosby not quit, you know, towards the end of next gen, she became like a actual like good character, so I'm glad they continued her her, her personal strengths after Nemesis into these novels, mm -hmm. um, and I look forward to many more Deanna moments. So the poop starts to hit the fan. We find out that Tuvok was the Romulan, so to yes. speak. How cool was that little like dream sequence? I'll call it. Mm -hmm. It was not really a dream. It was more like he's being tortured and mm -hmm. this is like what his brain is coming up with to deal with it. Um, but it was 
interesting to go like in one long, basically like one giant paragraph, just jumping from thing to thing and going like through Tuvok's life from like uh, his time with um, Sulu. Mm -hmm. Sulu gets a little cameo. Janeway gets a little cameo. Who else gets a little cameo in that? A few others, but I really like that whole dream sequence. In that time on with Sulu, there is a book called Excelsior Forged in Fire. And that book, I haven't read it. It's on my eBay wish list. I, I'm actually watching one currently. But <laughs> um, that book will go into detail about his time aboard the Excelsior. What other plottish moments do you have picked out for us? Any any points of discussion? Well, points of discussion. So, I mean, Romulan politics. This book is heavy on Romulan politics. There's another reason I had trouble getting through it. It's yeah. very politics heavy. And I uh, political thrillers are not really my jam. Uh, so... There's that. And I'm just going to throw this out here. And please don't hate me. World, world, me. No, world around me. I could care less about the Remans. I'm so sorry. I, di I didn't like them oh. and Nemesis as, as a character. They just came out of nowhere. They've never been mentioned yeah. anywhere before. And then all of a sudden, oh, there's another faction of Romulans? Although, I, I mean... <sighs> You do kind of learn to pity them a little bit in this book. And then you do get to see more of kind of who they could be if they weren't vilified, like they were a nemesis. Right. Um, because they they take care of Tuvok. They nurse him back to health. Some of them want to kill him because they're all in prison together by the Romulans. Yeah. And... There's this one named, oh my gosh, this crazy name. Let me see if, let me see how bad I can butcher this name. Mekrakuk. <laughs> All <laughs> sure. these names. Mekrakuk. Oh. So Mekrakuk is another Riemann, he's a Riemann prisoner and he, he's the one who really befriends Tuvok. They mind meld and they use their psionic abilities to help each other, help everyone escape and... Um, he's he's saved at, near near the end, and um, he's in sick bay. And something Deanna Troy says to him because Deanna Troy obviously was not a big fan of the Remans, and she says, "We're all unique." Mekrakuk, Troy said quietly, and I'll do my best to remember that in the future. That that was one of those moments where you just you see the love that Deanna is capable of. So, you know, she went through such terror at the hands of one of these individuals. And it took a lot for her to see past that when she's dealing with him. Um but yeah, I wasn't a fan of the Remans, but um Romulan politics. We'll swing back there. So there are so m they drop so many names too. So you have yeah, the, you have the I mean, there's, and then there's Tomalak. Tomalak was with Talora, and we've seen him before on Next Gen. And, yeah, but it's like oh, my, I. It's hard to keep them all straight, and, and then we had Pardek. Pardek was big in the whole anti mm -hmm. reunification movement, yeah. and he's killed by the Tal Shiar. So it's, it, I just, I don't care about Romulan politics. <laughs> we well, have, we well have you a, know. We have enough politic problems of our we own do. in this country. Well, you know, worlds turn by politics as surely as they do by gravity. So <laughs> there you go. That says it all right there. <laughs> yeah. So really, I mean, the big draw of this story is Titan getting thrown out of the universe Slash Galaxy. It's very... And now they're off on an adventure, a la Voyager. Voyager, or perhaps 
Discovery. <laughs> I mean, I guess since I since Discovery is more fresh in my mind, my mind went to Discovery when they did that last spore jump and wound up in the middle of Nowheresville in the Mirror Universe. But I I do also like that Dinatra was a, a major player in this book because I kind of liked her nemesis and her warship and nemesis is one of my is probably my favorite Romulan warship. But well, and the thing I like about the books is you don't have to uh, wait for an actor to be available to yeah. reprise the role. So <laughs> you can reprise as many characters as you want in the novels, and it's great. So we'll see. Um, that's one of the things I'm enjoying most about the novels, I think, is just all these characters that you wish you had more of, you can get more of in the novels. Mm -hmm. Another big kind of obsessive thing towards the end of the book when they were going through this big Star Trek space battle with, with the Raymans and the Romulans and the Klingons, they kept looking over to the wall where the ship plaque should be, the dedication plaque. So they, they took off from Starbase and they did not get their... They didn't get their dedication plaque? They did not have a dedication plaque. What? And so they they get to near the end of the novel and Riker and Vale keep looking over there and they just... It was kind of it was kind of overkill. I mean, it's like, I know the metaphor that they're working for. I know that they're they're thinking that this is bad luck that they left without their dedication quote on the wall. And I mean, cause it looked like. Cause they're going to pick the quote, right? Yeah. Because that's what they were discussing earlier. Yeah. But you know, it looks like in this battle that it could be the end of Titan because it's getting, it's getting hot and heavy out there. But yeah, I mean, it, that to me was just kind of overkill. Oh, speaking of dedication plaque quotes, um, I highlighted one. Among the map makers of each generation are the risk takers, those who see the opportunity, seize the moment, and expand man's visions of the future. And it's in pink, so it's important. <laughs> I'm glad that you that you color your highlights. I color code my notes, so I have like a color for humorous moments and a color for that's cool, and then a color for oh my god, that's amazing. <laughs> so speaking of quotes, are there any quotes that really stood out to you that we have not mentioned? Several. Everything is connected, Kent, Jaza said, speaking up again at last, even when you think it isn't. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's subtle, and sometimes it's Paradoxal, it may take generations to see those connections and longer still to understand them, or those things may simply come all at once in a flash of insight. You just never know. So don't make the mistake of pursuing knowledge arrogantly. Keep an open mind. Speaking of Kent, I have a, a little cute boy Kent quote too. So this was kind of after he was schooled by... Mm -hmm. uh, by Ogawa, he says, I guess I'm just not used to being part of such an obvious minority. Being a human on a ship with a crew as varied as this one, I mean. It suddenly occurred to him that he himself had been a mi minority of quite another sort for as long as he could remember. A fact that never bothered him, nor anyone else in his life. So that that really kind of is the essence to me of this diverse crew. I love the fact that some of the humans are looking at this through a different perspective. You know, mm -hmm. they're so used to, they're so used to being the majority. I mean, it's like in our country how white males are so used to privilege and how when they lose any bit of that privilege how shocking it is to them yeah i like that quote as well that was a good moment and it shows you that this is going to be a very different kind of like star trek novel because yeah. everyone's going to have a unique perspective mm -hmm. on any situation um i do have another one actually i have a couple but we'll see um 
Isn't the best aspect of exploring the chance to take away the knowledge that things can not only be different, but also that those differences can be celebrated? Yet another inclusive diversity quote. I know. It's like <laughs> it's like we're an inclusive diverse network. <laughs> it's like we're on some kind of USS melting pot. <laughs> <laughs> I love that quote. That was a I do too. That was really cute. <laughs> what else you got? So one of my favorites from very near the beginning of the book, it was Riker talking to Troy. And it's really when they're dealing with kind of this post nemesis feel. So, you know, after Dominion War, after the battle wish is on, now we've come out the other side. And for the first time in nearly a decade, it feels like we have a chance to get back to some of what we lost during those years. We can do the things we set out to do when we joined Starfleet in the first place. The things I grew up believing Starfleet was primarily about. This mission, this ship, is my chance, our chance, to help. When the, when the mission that they want to do, this scientific mission, is taken away, it really, that quote comes back to you. Because this book goes from being a happy beginning to uh exploratory we're getting our getting our feet ready to go and then they go into this you know huge political polit- political quagmire and a huge battle and they lose people within the first mission which mm. can't be easy no my favorite quote is actually from Deanna Troy and it's at the secret meeting where she is commanding her commanding personality she says to everyone at the table, the Remans won't care about your political differences, she said, maintaining a commanding tone that she somehow kept just a few decibels short of shrill and shrillness. They won't care about who served Shenzhen and who opposed him. They won't care about your internal grudges and petty feuds. All they will care about is what you represent to them, oppression. You show them this kind of weakness and disunity, and they will scoop out your brains and eat them. If you expect to make long-term peace with them instead of more war, then you better start setting aside your differences. Now, sit down. (laughs) Get it. Get it, Deanna. I think the only other time we ever saw Deanna really get this worked up, I want to say it was in Gambit, the one when Picard was supposedly dead and Riker was commanding the ship and she turns to him and she said, she says, do you think that you're the only one who's going through this? And do you think you're the only one who's suffering? And she was like, basically what this quote was, I like, that was what she was doing then too. All right. So do you have anything else you want to talk about for Titan? For Titan, stealth suits are really cool. Stealth suits? Stealth suits are awesome. So when they when they go to rescue Tuvok and Spock, the Starfleet away mission, their, the away team, they're wearing these suits that basically cloak them. Mm. And those like the were, TAS utility belts? Yes. Those were awesome. I mean, the way they're describing them, it seemed like there was something new, but I guess we have seen something kind of similar when you think of insurrection, because they on that planet they were wearing those mm-hmm. with Data's head. Popping yeah, up. but yes, that was another one of my favorite little. So I have a question for you, Marty. Hmm. Did you like the book overall? Yeah, um, it was a little tedious at moments, but overall, I liked the book. How about you? I did. I think I'm more excited for where it's going than yeah, like the actual, you know, like like you said, like seeing like the starship being like set up as they're getting ready to launch is kind of cool, yeah. and you know, space battle is always cool. But I I think you know, looking back on things, there were I did have some 
problems with a few of the plot points. I did not care so much for the repetition that was going on. I didn't care for real down times and then super exciting times. It was really back and forth. But I know, I mean, once again, I don't know if that's two authors or what, but to me, it was kind of disjointed at times. Titan gets very different, though. Mm. Very different. Things are going to change. This, um, not to spoil you too much, but this kind of fun-loving crew atmosphere is going to get very serious. Wow, I can't wait. I can't wait. We never discussed the Titan herself. Oh, the actual ship. Oh, the actual ship. Did you? Uh, do you remember them ever describing the way she looks? No. Do you want to know why? Is it a surprise? Is it a no, spoiler? it's not a spoiler. So at the time that this book came out, they were doing a contest. It was a contest for the fans to design the USS Titan. Oh, that's kind of cool. And the if you were to if you look at the back in the back of the book, they have the offer for is, mm-hmm. that, is that the word you would use the offer the the information yeah and so you you were able to draw in your design and send it in and the fourth novel sort of Democles is when we see the first rendition of the Titan so they didn't describe the Titan yet because they didn't know what she was going to look like so she has a total of 350 crew members aboard so not as big as an Enterprise D, but bigger than the Enterprise mm-hmm. Constitution, I believe. Much bigger than the NX. <laughs> Definitely bigger than the NX. Everything's <laughs> bigger than the NX. Not space seed. <laughs> All right, so we have a couple uh, tweets to read from fans of Titan and followers of Reading Trek on Twitter. So I asked I asked on Twitter what everyone's thoughts were on the Star Trek Titan novel. Um, and we have at, at Kristen1 replied saying, I loved it. For a series starter, it went off with a bang. The split of the Empire and how the various guest characters from other series like, like Melora Paslar, Spock, and Ogawa was pretty awesome. Um, and then Isolinear Chick replied, I enjoyed the hell out of the Titan's Doctor basically being a giant, well-spoken velociraptor. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your comments. And yes, thank you. Now, I think we'll wrap things up unless you have anything else for Titan. I think I'm good with taking wing. I think that we have flown this bird out of here. Mm-hmm. But before we close up shop, I just want to really quickly mention that we would love to get a few star ratings and reviews on iTunes to help spread the love for the show. And in fact, we got one recently that I'd like to read um, from Jerusalem Jack on iTunes. He writes, hi, I am new to this podcast. I was very excited to find it and have high hopes for a Trek book podcast. You guys have done a great job so far. I like how you break down and really discuss the characters and plot. I keep checking and not seeing any new podcasts. What has happened? Please come back with new recordings. Keep the great work of sharing truck novels with everyone. Tons of material out there. Take care, guys. Oh, no. We're so sorry. We're so sorry. We've taken so long to get back um, to podcasting Jerusalem Jack, but we are here. We are back. We are excited for a 2019 full of Star Trek novels, so... Um, thank you for your uh, star rating and review. As always, we'd like to hear your thoughts on this week's episode, and we'll still take your thoughts on Star Trek Titan. Um, you can send us a tweet at Reading Trek. You can email us, readingtrekpodcast at gmail.com. You can find us on the web at readingtrek.thetricordertransmissions.com. Um, you can also find the network there as well at the thetricordertransmissions.com. We have lots of shows. So many shows. Uh, I can't even list them all off right now because I'll forget one and then I'll feel bad. But um, check out all the shows on the network. I'm sure you'll find another show that that tickles your fancy because we have one for just about every topic. And a few more on the way, I think, which is just 
insane because we have so many shows already. Well, we have new Star Trek on the air, so... I know. It's going to be exciting. But uh, before we go, Christian, how can people get a hold of you if they want to continue the conversation? You can find me on Twitter. I'm trying to be more active on Twitter. It's at Jewel underscore zero five. My last name is spelled J-U-E-L underscore zero five. How about you, Marty? I'm on Twitter at Time Travel Marty. Um, and I'm also on Facebook. I'm one of the admins of the uh, Queer Trek group on Facebook, which is tied to the Queer Trek podcast on the Tricorder Transmissions Network, which is my other show that I host with Heather Barker. Um, so feel free to check that out if you'd like. Um, but for now, I guess we will end by saying that Captain Picard, or in this case, Captain Riker, would like us to let him read in peace. Do you think Captain Riker reads? Are I think th- he plays his trombone more than he Probably. reads. Probably. Yeah. Good point. I will leave you now to your book. That is all I ask. <laughs>